Amen. Good morning. This morning, as I was walking into the sanctuary, I was talking to uh, John Blackaby, and he said some chemistry words, and it made me remember how horrible of a chemistry student I was in college. And I would always fail the exams because I didn't know any of the solutions. You know how many bones are in a human hand? A handful, right? No, man. Hey, before we get started this morning, I'm going to be a little transparent. I hope that's okay with you. I have had some intense spiritual warfare this morning. Just self-doubt and the enemy speaking into my brain this morning. And I'm going to pray. Hold on. And as I pray, I would appreciate it if you're not just listening to me pray. But if you would just pray for me right now, I would really appreciate it. Can we go? Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for the ability and the calling that you put up on my life. Father, and I pray that this morning... that the words that you would have me to say would speak to people. And Lord, I pray for all of us here this morning, Lord, that all of the walls that we've built up, that you would help us to break those down. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done. And we thank you for what you're about to do. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So last week, we started on this series through the book of Matthew. And we got through about the first 17 verses. And it might take us a little while if you're paying attention to get through this book. But we're going to take it slowly and go through that. But last week, what we talked about is how right from the beginning of the book, Matthew is talking to us about Jesus because, listen, in this world, there are tons of different views that we can have on the world. There are tons of different ways that we can see life, that we could see the future and how things are supposed to go. We could be a secularist and we can believe that there are no such thing as spiritual things. That there is but one life, and when we die, it's over and nothing else matters. Or we could be part of different religions and you could have this religious idea that there is a God who is separate from us. And we have to do more and more good works to attain that God's love. But right from the very beginning of the book, Matthew says, hey, everything that you've thought, everything that you think, Everything that you thought of about the end, it's all wrapped up into Jesus. So what we need to know the most that he was telling us is that, who is this Jesus? And we'll pick up the story here in verse 18, and we'll read through the end, and it says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man... And unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive a son, or shall conceive and bear a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. And when we read this story, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. Because the way that they're handling the situation isn't the way that we handle relationships now. See, the way that they're handling this story is completely crazy to our idea. And we read this, and it says that he was going to divorce her, her husband. And it says they were betrothed. So we think, well, are they married? 
And if they're not married, why do they have to get a divorce? What's, what's going on here? And the thing that we need to realize is that in betrothal, in the ancient world, there were three stages of betrothal. And the first stage of betrothal was what they called the ketubah stage. And this ketubah stage was a legal contract. It was a contract between a girl's father and a man. And they would be saying, hey, you know what, You're, we're going to marry one day. This could happen from the time that the, the, the girl was born. It could last anywhere between 1 and 10 or 15 years, just however long it needed to be. And inside this contract, there were all kinds of clauses set up. For instance, there was a bride price. The man had agreed that he was going to pay so much to have this woman as his bride. He was going to pay the father a price. Not only that, there was a price to pay if he broke the ketubah. See, the reason that that was in there is it was to protect women. It was to keep men from running away from their obligations, and it protected them. So there was all this stuff that was set up. And in this time, they were considered married, but they didn't live together. They didn't live together, but they were considered to be married. And it lasted until the man could pay, or until the, this boy that had been put in this contract had decided that he could pay the bride price. And this is a really crazy story to us, and it's so much different than the way that we handle things. Because, listen, these parents were fully involved in their children's dating life. A lot of weird sounds going on. So they, they followed them around, right? They were chaperoned. They were never allowed to be alone. They didn't just let two kids go off and just assume they were going to make the good decisions, that they had given them the right tools to make the right decision. That didn't happen. They chaperoned them. And see, what's weird to us is we live in this society, and I think most of us would tell our kids that we want them to remain a virgin until they're married. And this is what we see here. They're telling them that you have to stay that way. But for some reason in this country... Not only do we tell our kids that, but for some reason in America, the average age of marriage is slowly and surely going up. For a while, it was around 24, and now it's slowly and surely making its way towards 30. So not only are we telling our children, hey, we don't want you to have sex until you're married, but then we're also telling them, hey, look, you can't get married until you graduate from college. Until you have a good job, until you have a nice down payment for a house, we want you to wait. Until you have everything that you're going to need, because what we're trying to teach our kids is to not make a mistake, right? You need to have it all together. But listen, when you're young and you're married, you can live off of love and air, right? Isn't that all you need? I mean, you can just make it work. But we're telling people, hey, just wait. Just wait. Don't have sex, but just wait. Because this idea is that our spouse in our marriage is supposed to fulfill us. We're teaching our children that their spouse is supposed to fulfill their life. That their spouse is supposed to give them all of their joy. So you have to wait for the one to come along. Wait till you get it right. Wait till the perfect one, the one that God has created to you to get there. So we tell them to wait. It's, it's got to be perfect. But listen, if you've been married for a while, what you're going to realize, you married a sinner. I'm not even looking at you. You're in trouble. And there are going to be times when that perfect person that you married doesn't live up to your expectations. No matter how perfect they were, there are going to be times when they don't live up to your expectations. But we tell our children, hey, wait till you find the one and everything's going to fall into line and it's all going to be beautiful and it's all going to be roses and everything's going to be perfect. But it's not that way. 
what we need to realize is that we're all sinners, and we need to figure out how to live with each other as sinners and make a life that's happy together. We tell our kids, hey, man, you got to wait until you're 30. Get all your life together. Don't be doing what you're doing. And I don't know if you've been watching, but I think that what we're teaching our kids in this country might not be working. Teenagers, you might want to listen when your parents tell you something about the person that you're dating or that you're attempting to date. I know you think they're idiots, but they're not. They kind of know what they're talking about. They can kind of see things in people that you might not be able to see because you're so in love. But that's the way it used to be. These families were involved. The communities were involved. And it was an amazing thing. So the first stage was the ketubah. And the second stage of, of betrothal was the chupa stage. And this is when the girl was of age. She was of age and the man could finally provide the bride price. And there was no wedding. But here's what would happen. When they reached this age and the man finally had enough money to, to pay the bride price, what they would do is they would invite all of their friends and family over to the father of the lady's house. And this would be when the consummation of the marriage happened. So all the friends and family would be in one room, and the couple would go into the next room, and they would consummate the marriage, and then they would come out, and everyone would cheer. How awkward would that be? <laughs> but that's the way they did it. And then after that, they would move into the wedding feast stage, and they would celebrate for weeks at a time. So here we find Mary and Joseph in the Ketubah stage. And what, what's going on, if you read it in light of that, it's making perfect sense. So Joseph, he's a carpenter. He's helping to provide for Mary as she's still in her father's house. He's trying to raise enough money so that he can pay the bride price so he can move into the chupa stage. And everything is going great. Until one day this bomb is dropped. Mary's pregnant. And in that world, things would have been turned completely upside down for Joseph. Joseph would have been in a, this really weird predicament. So he, he plans to divorce her. And verse 19 says, And her husband Joseph, being a just man, some versions say righteous man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. See, he loved her. He was righteous. He was just. He knew what was right. And he wanted to do the right thing. But he loved her. And see, and in that time, she could have been stoned for what she had done. But he didn't want that for her because he cared for her. So it says he decided to do this quietly. And listen, this is a tough decision. Because if he divorces her, if he leaves her, if he decides that he's going to break the ketubah, he's going to have to pay this large amount of money to her father. And if he decides that he wants to stay with her and keep this promise, then not only is he going to be raising another man's son, not only is he going to be made fun of in that society, but he's still going to have to pay the price. So he's in this place where he's having to pay the price for something that he thinks that Mary has done wrong. Most of us can't even fathom the dilemma that he was really in in that world. The place that he had found himself in. But he wants to break it quietly. He wants to do the right thing. He loves her. 
And it's a tough decision that he's going to have to make. And I wonder if there are any of us here this morning that we have some tough decisions to make. Maybe we're not deciding the same thing that Joseph is. But maybe we're deciding which job we need to take. We've come to this place in our life and God has put these two options before us and we've got to decide what we're going to do next. Or maybe we see what one of our friends is doing, and they're doing some stuff that we know that they shouldn't be. And we've got to decide whether it's time to tell them what they need to do. Tell them the line that they need to walk down. Tell them that they're going down the wrong path. Or maybe we have to decide if we're going to take responsibility for something that we've done. Even though we could get away with it. Even if it cost us everything. Maybe we find ourselves there. And if, and if you're, or maybe, maybe what God is telling you to do is you need to step out on faith. And you, the money that you had planned to use to go on a family vacation, he wants you to go to Haiti and touch some kids' lives. But we all face tough decisions. In this life, there will be tough decisions, almost certainly another one coming down the road. So here's a blueprint through the life of Joseph, of how we can do this. And see, what, what he does and what most of us do is when we get into this place where we have to make a decision, we ask this question, well, what's next? What am I supposed to do? What now? And we want to know all of our options. We want to know what we're supposed to do. How many different ways can I do it? What are the other ways to get through this? We want to know our options. He probably went to his rabbi. He probably went to his dad. Dad, man, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do next? But really, that's the wrong question. See, if we're looking at the Bible, the Bible tells us to start from a very different place. And see, there's this difference between worldly decisions and godly decisions. See, worldly decisions start with, what am I supposed to do? And godly decisions start with, who am I? See, worldly decisions start with, what am I supposed to do? And godly decisions start with, who am I? Because listen, we make our decisions, godly decisions, based on our character. Based on who we are. And here in this version, it says that he was a just man. In other versions, it says he was a righteous man. And what that means is when people looked at him, they probably saw him as honest. They probably saw him as fair. They probably saw him as not a person that was seeking revenge. They were a person that was always nice. He was always doing the right things. He was righteous. And we would think that he would make decisions based upon his righteousness, based on the man that he was. And what he's about to do is he's about to make a righteous decision in a very wrong way. You can make righteous decisions in a wrong way. I was reading this book, and it's by John Eldridge. It's called Fathered by God, and he talked about an example of this. Men, if you want to know why you make decisions like you make, you should read Fathered by God. Women, if you want to know why your husband acts the way he does and why he responds the way he does, you should read it too because it talks about men really deeply. But in this book, what he talks about is he said there was this one time when missionaries came to his church. And they were talking about all the mission work they were doing overseas and all the good things they were doing. And inside him, it stirred him. He needed to do something. He needed to do something. And when they passed the plate around, he pulled out his wallet and he looked and he had a $20 bill left. So he grabbed the $20 bill and he threw it into the plate. He said the moment that he did, God spoke to him and he said, I didn't tell you to do that. And he started arguing with God. (laughs) Come on, God. This is a great thing. They're doing great things there. How How could you not be telling me to do such this righteous act? You know that this was a good thing. And he's arguing with God. And when service is over, he walks out to his car. And standing beside his car is a homeless man. And he said, very clearly, God said, I wanted you to give it to him. See, he made a righteous decision. 
See, what he did was right. He was doing the right thing, but he did it without seeking God first. See, godly decisions start with our character. Who am I? But then they follow God's direction. And what we see here in the life of Joseph is he's about to make a righteous decision, but he's about to make it in a wrong way. He's about to do the righteous thing, but he's never sought God and saw what God wanted him to do. And if he had done what he wanted to do, he would have written himself out of history books forever. He would have never been part of this really great story of what, we had done, of what we're seeing here in the life of Jesus. He never would have been part of it. If you look here at verse 20, it says, But as he considered these things, he's considering what he's supposed to do. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Son of Joseph, son of David, do not fear. And we talked about this a little bit last week, about how he's, he's not actually the son of David. But what he's doing is he's trying to recall to his mind everything that he needs to know. See, as Joseph would have known of David's life and of all the things that he had done, Joseph would have known that, that David was a man that the Bible said would do anything that God had called him to do. Joseph would have known that. And this angel is trying to say, aren't you his son? Aren't you just like him? Then you too should do exactly everything that God is telling you to do. So take her home. This is God's plan. He said, don't break the ketubah. So godly decisions start with our character. Who am I? And then we follow God's direction. And sometimes we have to do the hard thing. I remember when we were in South Georgia and I was a youth pastor under the man that I still call my mentor. I could probably still be there being his youth pastor to this day. He was great. I love him to death. And I could have been youth pastor and I could have been preaching all the times that he wanted to take off. And I could still be there, but God called us away. And that's a tough decision. And you ask God, well, what am I supposed to do? Why? God, why do you want me to do this? And sometimes instead of answering that, instead of telling you why, what he does is he reminds us of who you are. So I said, God, why are you calling me away? And he says, well, Adam, you're a pastor of the gospel. I've called you to share my word. And sometimes when we ask God why, he doesn't tell us why, but he reminds us of who we are. Matthew 124 says, when Joseph woke up from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. See, the Lord gives us direction, but then it's up to us to choose. The Lord told Joseph what to do. And when he woke up from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. See, so Jerry Kantz says, when faced with two equally tough choices, most people choose the third choice, not to choose. If the worship team would come. See, we put off decisions because we don't want to decide. We don't want to do the wrong thing. We don't, we don't want to hurt people. We don't want to do the tough thing. We don't know what's going to happen. And we just hope that maybe someday, maybe somehow, the situation will resolve itself. Maybe it'll all get figured out. But it never does. We have to choose. The third option is a choice in itself. It's choosing not to. And look, a lot of us, we can't make decisions. We can't make godly decisions because we don't know who we are. 
We've never made a statement of faith of our own. We've never taken our faith as our own to be able to follow God and make him and go to the places he's called us to go. In Joshua, it says, choose for yourself this day who you will serve. We've got to choose. And every morning that we wake up, Whether you like it or not, you have to make that exact same choice. Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Choose who you are and choose to make decisions based on that and the Lord's direction in your life. There are so many of us that we want the Lord's direction and we want him to lead us and we never hear his voice because we've never taken our faith as our own. Will you stand with me this morning? Here in a moment, the team is going to begin to play. And if you need prayer this morning, I'm here. I would love to pray with you. Our prayer team is over here to my right. They would love to pray with you this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all the blessings that you pour out upon our lives. Jesus, I'm so grateful. Father, I thank you that you always come through. Father, I thank you that you still speak to your children. Lord, I pray that this week you would help us to choose you every day. Choose to follow you into the tough places. Lord, I pray for all of us here this morning that are making tough decisions. Help us to hear your voice clear. And help us to have the strength and the wisdom to choose you and follow you into those places. Jesus, we love you. It's in your precious name we pray.